Hello friends, good evening. Praise be to God, it's another th Tuesday to come together. Bless the name of the Lord. Thank you Lord, thank you God for yet another day. <clears throat> Our lives are in your hands, oh God. No matter what may come my way. Good evening friends, my life is in your hands. No matter what. Hallelujah, good evening. Welcome, no matter what you're going through. <laughs> let's just start by listening to this song and meditate on it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. You have to worry. <laughs> you don't have to be afraid. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to be afraid. Joy is coming in the morning. Till the last always. All that depend on Jesus. We have a friend in Jesus who wipes away our tears. <laughs> and when your heart is broken, <laughs> just lift your hands and say, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what, make up my way. My life is in your hands. Thank you, Jesus. No matter what may come our way, we know our life is in your hands. <laughs> you don't be afraid. Joy comes in the morning. Take the last of us. Hallelujah. Then we have a friend who is named Jesus. <laughs> who will wipe away our tears and if your heart is broken <laughs> lift your hands and say oh I know that I can make it <laughs> I know that I can stay no matter what may come my way my life is in your hands. Oh, in whose hands? My life is in God's. <laughs> it's in God's hands. With Jesus, I will make it. Mm. With him, I know I will stand. The world may come my way. My life is in your hands. No matter what may come our way, our lives are in his hands. Mm. Yes, when we have tests and trials, they seem to get us down. <laughs> and all our friends and loved ones may be nowhere to be found. Hallelujah. Remember, we have a friend in Jesus <laughs> who will wipe away our tears. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> if your heart is broken, and this is all you have to do. Just lift up your hands and say, Oh, that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in God's hands. The world that just I can take it. Mm. Be like who I stand No matter what may come my way My life is in your hands Know that I can make it I know that I can stand No matter what may come my way my life is in your hands. I know. Ah, with Jesus, I will make it. Before I stand, no matter what may come my way, 
my life is in God's hands. I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, our life is in God's hands. Oh, hallelujah. With Jesus, we will make it. When Jesus will stand, hallelujah, no matter what may come our way, <laughs> our lives are in God's hands. What a joy, what confidence, what hope that gives to know that no matter what, no matter what may come our way, God's got our lives in his hands. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise be to God. In your hands, no matter what may come my way, my life is in God's hands. Hallelujah, praise be to God. What joy, what joy, what untainted joy it gives for us to know that no matter, no matter means no matter what may come our way, no matter what afflictions, no matter what test, no matter what trial we have to go through in life, no matter how devastating the hardships we face may be, our lives are in God's hands. God's got our lives in his hands. And that gives me joy. It gives me hope. It makes me confident of a better tomorrow that no matter what happens to me today, no matter what I am going through now, my life is in God's hands. And I'm praying that you also will be inspired to hold fast to hope, no matter what you're going through, that you will know that your life is in God's hands. Last week, we started on a topic. You know, this October, I have asked you, to ask me questions or uh, send me topics or, that you would like us to discuss further or areas that you want us to dig deeper, you know, and discuss more about. And the question we started talking about last week is when God doesn't fix, fix it. I mean, this situation comes in our lives. We have prayed and prayed and prayed, fasted and fasted and fasted. God is not answering in the way we want, in our own timing. So what do we do? We have cried and we've screamed. We have done everything we know to do. And all you're just saying, God, why won't you just fix this situation? Why won't you just turn this situation, this moment, this instant? I want a miracle here. And yet there is, seems to be a delay, a silence. What do we do? And so we talked about focusing our attention on the truth. Last week, I, I shared about one of the truths that we must focus our attention on when life happens to us this way is that God loves us. You must remember that God loves you. There is no, don't ever allow the enemy to tell you that the reason why all the hard things are happening or why you're going through these challenges is because God has stopped loving you. Absolutely a lie from the devil, from the pit of hell. God can never stop loving you. I mean, I made bold to tell us last week that God loves us just as much as he loved Jesus. And if you missed that episode, I would encourage you to listen to it. It's If you scroll down on this page, we talked about Remembering that God loves us, that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. And Jesus loves us with the same love with which the Father loves him. Check out John 15 and John 17. And you will hear Jesus saying that I have loved them even as you have loved me. So I, I, for me, that is a comforting statement. That's a comforting truth. It's a place, I, it's a solid rock. I can put my head to rest on in the midst of the storm. It, stable, it stabilizes me knowing that God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. And if he loves me as much as he loves Jesus, no matter what may come my way, my life is in his hands. Even when it doesn't fix that situation, 
my life is in his hands. We also talked about recognizing that trials are opportunities. They provide us opportunity for growth. They provide us for opportunity, opportunities for refinement. They, they refine our faith and bring out the quality of our faith. We looked at that last week. And then we also talked about our, tra you know, our story matters. Yes, we are going through these hard times. Yes, we've been waiting for a long time in the waiting room, waiting for the answer to come to this prayer. But while we're going through, while we're going through, we remember, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God tells us that we will never be alone. He will be there with us. Even when we walk through the floods, he is there with us. He says when we, the, we walk through fire, he is there with us. The, our stories are evolving even in the midst of our crisis. And I can assure you that that God, I have experienced God in that way. All through the 20 plus years of my afflictions, my story was evolving and I was sharing the testimonies of the victories along the way. Even though I, would, I never knew it was gonna take that long for me to get to that place where my health will be restored. But along the way, there were so many victories that God was giving us, so many ways that God was coming through for us. And I was journaling them and sharing them. So and my God was using that story to inspire other people. In fact, there was a day, I was looking at the um, the analyt analytics on my on, on my blog because then I was blogging my experiences and I saw that people were reading from places I will never be able to get to on this on the surface of the earth. I mean names that I've never had before. One island, one place, one remote place. Be because they had access to internet, they had googled something and my story appeared. And it showed that they were reading it. And people were, you know, sending comments about how they, it inspired them. So in the midst of our crisis, we must not hold back our stories. Our stories matter to God. Even when God has not fixed it, even when God, it, it is not going the way we want, we must understand that God is using our story even in that moment as we are going through. So we talked a lot about this last week and why we must trust God completely, why our faith is the beginning of trusting God and that trust in God infuses us with confidence. But the more we trust in God, we are infused with the confidence that come what may, God has got this. God has this. And this is why this song that I just shared with you this evening really ministered a lot to me. And no matter what may come my way, with Jesus, I know I will make it. With Jesus, I know I will stand. Because I know that the high priest of my soul, he has been tried even worse more than I am being tried. He has been tested. He is, I have a high priest who is, you know, who, who is moved by my falling of infirmity because he has been in the same way tested. That is what the Bible tells us. He has been in the same way tested. And therefore, when God does not fix the situation, when things don't go the way we want, we can trust God completely. And the more we remind ourselves of God's love for us, which can never be diluted, which can never diminish, we cannot end that love. The, the quality of God's love for us remains unchanging because God himself is unchanging. And if we will focus our attention on this, when God doesn't fix it, we do not lose hope. We do not give up and we do not give in to despair. And the more we remind ourselves of the goodness of God and his favor, the more we, 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 our hearts are able to trust, learn to trust in God. Because you need an anchor for your hope. And it is in, in, in assuring ourselves, in the assurance of God's goodness, of God's favor, of all the many expressions of his kindness in our lives that we have seen. They inspire our heart to learn to trust God even when things don't go the way we want. Yeah, on this group, it's we're learning how to go beyond the pain. 
and find purpose in it. And while we are going through that painful experience, we need to keep this word of this truth in our heart that even if God does not fix it, even if things don't go the way I desire, I desire, what next? Would I turn my back on God or would I trust in his sovereignty? And so today we're going to continue in this discussion and I'm going to talk about a few other things that we can anchor, a few other truths in the word of God that we can anchor our hope on when God does not fix it. And one first one that I want to talk about today is that we must trust in the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. That attribute of God that makes him do what pleases him. <laughs> you know, there is an adage in my in local language, Yoruba, that says that God does what pleases him. But he is the source, the root of love. He is the depth of love. And so the way I translate is that everything that God does is good. And that is what Psalm 145 tells us. That everything, absolutely everything God does is good. He does not do any evil. But that Psalm went further in verse 9 to say it is infused with grace. Even when that good is not palatable for us. Even when what God is doing it seems to be exact opposite of what we want. But we have to trust that everything that God does is good. And he provides a grace that enables us to go through those times of our lives when what God does, just, just we just don't understand it. Because indeed he has told us that his ways are high above our ways. His thoughts as the heavens are high above the earth, so are God's thoughts are high above us. We only see in part. We are only desiring what we want based on what we know, what we can see. But God's knowledge is infinite. Our knowledge and our understanding is very limited, very narrow, very finite. But the sovereign God who is all-knowing, who is all-seeing, from whom absolutely nothing is hid, he knows how everything is going to play out. And therefore, when those situations come that God does not fix it, we need to trust in the sovereignty of God. They had, his sovereignty is his right and his power to do what pleases him because of who he is. He simply does what pleases him and everything that he does is good. Right? Good. You see, the sovereignty of God is the exercise of his supremacy. He is the supreme God. He is the all-knowing God, like I said. And therefore, when God chooses to exercise his supremacy, when he chooses to exercise his infinite role, his authority and power, we who are called by his name, who are his children, can rest in it that even if it's painful and it is hurtful at that moment, though that experience of our life, we know that God is working out a good because he promised that he will work it all together for our good. Because God sees beyond us. He sees beneath the surface. He sees the unseen. He knows the future. He knows the end of a matter even before it was conceived. And therefore, I'm going to have to trust that God knows all what he is doing. And Job tells us exactly the same thing. I mean, look at what happened to Job. He prayed, he prayed, he prayed for all his children. The Bible tells us right from book the, the chapter 1 that he was a righteous man who makes sacrifices by chance. His children have done something that will, you know, against the God. So we can never say, you can't say that what happened to Job was because he, was not, he didn't have enough faith or because he didn't pray enough. He was a prayerful man. He was a devout man. And yet... God permitted the enemy to touch him. To, you know, and it, it, it was like, I know, I go to saying that I know him. I am confident about Job. I know he will not deny me. I know he will not curse me. 
Even though his wife said, cross God and die, he died. I mean, he has taken, he done, taken everything from you. He has afflicted you. But God was boastful, was proud of, um, of, of Job. And that's why he could say to the devil, you, this far, all of this you can do this far, you will not go. It is because God trusted Job that Job would not deny him in the midst of his trials. And look at what Job said ultimately in chapter 42. At the last chapter of that 42 chapters long of affliction, of pain, of his friends turning against him, of, of, of their insults, of all the things that they said when he was still going through his crisis. What did Job say? He says, I know you can do anything. No one can stop you. No one can stop God. He can do anything. He is sovereign. He does what pleases him. I want to read that for us in a couple of other translations so that it can, you know, we can have a deeper understanding of it. One version says that I know, God, you are all powerful. No plans of yours can be opposed. No one can oppose God's plans. And that's what we must know, that God's plans concerning you and I, no one can oppose it. Even when everything we're looking at seems to be going upside down, not a single plan or purpose of God can be thwarted because God can do anything. No purpose of his can be thwarted. In, in the message translation said, I am convinced. Job answered God and said, I am convinced that you can do anything and everything. Nothing and no one can upset your plans. So if God can do anything and no one can thwart his plan, no one can thwart his purpose. And I know that God is not deficient in any way. So when God acts in a certain way, and we don't seem to understand it. We need to trust in his sovereignty. When God acts in a certain way and we do not understand it, we need to trust in the sovereignty of God, his all-knowingness, his supremacy, his overall infinite authority and power. He acts in a way that pleases him. God is not constrained to do anything that he doesn't want to do. He does only that which pleases him. He cannot be backed into the corner. No one can thwart his plan. And there is absolutely nothing that is difficult for God to do when it fits into his agenda, when it fits into his purposes, when it fits into his plans. And so if God doesn't fix that situation, I'm just going to have to trust that God knows how this puzzle that I can't make out fits in the larger picture. Because it's like our lives here on earth is like a million pieces puzzle, jigsaw puzzle. Can you imagine trying to fix a million pieces of jigsaw puzzles when you don't have the picture in front of you? You don't have the picture. You don't have the full picture. You don't know how all these tiny pieces fit together. But the God, our Lord, who is the sovereign God, he knows exactly what the, path, the, the final picture looks like. He knows how each of our experiences will fit together to bring that perfect picture. And therefore, in my limited understanding, if I don't know how it fits in, it behoves me to say, God, you know what you're doing. You are the supreme ruler. Who personally rules in the affairs of men? That's what the Bible tells us. In Daniel chapter 4, chapter 4 verse 17, it says, this sentence, you know, this was when it was pronouncing a sentence on um, Nebuchadnezzar. And it said, this sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers. And the decision is a command of the holy ones, so that the living may know Without doubt that the most high God rules over the kingdom of mankind and he bestows it to whomsoever he desires and sets it over the humblest and lowliest of men. God 
rules in the affairs of men. He is the supreme ruler who personally rules in everything that pertains to you and I. Our lives are in God's hands. I mean, I, keep rem I have to keep reminding myself, and I want you also to keep reminding yourself, that no matter what you're going through, no matter what it is that you want God to fix, that it appears as if he is not fixing it right now, your life is in God's hands. God is the supreme ruler of your universe. And he's, he has the final say. Who has the final say but God? Who has the final say concerning you but God? You yourself don't even have the final say concerning you. The sovereign God has the final say over your life and over my life. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 1 to 4, tells us thus. He said, we can make our own plans. We have our dreams. We have our desires. It is God who knows the intent of our heart. He says, we can make our own plans, but God gives the right answer. People may be pure in their own eyes, but God examines their motive. Commit all your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. For the Lord has made everything for his purpose. Even the wicked is for a day of disaster. You see, yes, there are so many desires that we want. There are things that we want God to do for us. But we may think our desires are pure. God knows the motive behind it. He knows whether that would take us off track. He knows where it may lead us to. So if it doesn't fit God's plans, I have to give God the permission to hold it back. Because God, the Bible tells me that every, he, he does everything. He's made everything for his purpose. I want to read that in a couple of other translations just to amplify it for us. As usual, so I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation. It says, go ahead, make all your plans the one you want. But it is the Lord who ultimately directs your steps. And that's what I want my life to be like. That God, if this path that I'm going, it's not where you want me to go. Please, Lord, even at the last minute, stop it. Because I don't want to go out of your will. I don't want to first my, myself in a direction. That is contrary to your will for me. And so God, you know, he, 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 he is the one who knows how correct our intentions are. He says, but the Lord is in the midst of us. He is testing and probing our every motive. Ah, we are righteous in our own sight. But God knows our hearts. He knows. He searches deep within. You know one verse of the Bible that always gets me? It's that chapter verse that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, you know, for, uh, 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 and repent, humble themselves and repent from their sins. He says that I will forgive them if they turn away from their wicked ways. It always baffles me that how can people that God says, my people who are called by my name. Be in the same sentence with will turn from their wicked ways. So that means these people who are turned, called by the name of the Lord, were walking in wickedness. They are transacting in wickedness. Did they know it or not? But you see, it may look pure to us. And that's why, like David, we must constantly pray to God, search my heart, O oh God. And see if there is anything in me that is contrary to your will. And that's why we need to have this fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That we can hear, you know, it can nudge us when we are going off track. When our thoughts are going off track, it's like, ah, 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 ah. Or you want to do something, I say, check your motives. We all need a regular heart check. So that when we are asking, we're asking in line and in tune with God's will. Bible says, says we ask and we do not receive because we ask to consume for our own pleasure. There are some things that we are demanding from, from God that, we, that is not fitted into God's purpose. 
And God will not reneach on, he will not lower his standard for us to accommodate us. And so when it looks as if God is not fixing the situation, I've got to trust that God knows the reason why that is not what is right for me, good for me at that point in time. That there is a timing for it. Even if it's a righteous desire that I see in the word of God that he says that he will do this. And there seems to be a delay in my own chronos timing. Because God does not walk by chronology. He walks by his kairos moment. He says a thousand years is like a moment in God's sight. So if in my own timing it is not working according to when my schedule, it, 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 it means that my schedule is at variance with God's schedule. Imagine when Elizabeth was, uh, was trusting and praying for a child, for a child, and it seems long in the, for the child coming. But you see, it was appointed for John to be born at a time that was close enough for him to announce Jesus Christ. He could not have come earlier if he was going to fit into God's purpose. And so God's timing is different from our timing. And this is one of the things that trusting in God's sovereignty will help us to understand that God has his own timing. And oftentimes, our chronological timing are at variance with this timing. The Lord works everything together to accomplish his purpose. Everything that we experience, as long as we are called by the name of the Lord, as long as we, 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 we are his own and we are standing on the authority of his word, he will work everything together to accomplish his purpose. Ultimately, what we want is for God's purpose to be accomplished in our lives. And I would rather have God's purpose accomplished in my life than have my own purpose accomplished. So every prayer that I pray, I'm praying that my purpose, my dreams, my desire is in line. And thank God we have the Holy Spirit who aligns our prayers, who aligns our will, who aligns our desire with the will of God. Let's go on. So we trust in God's sovereignty. The next thing that we must also do is to rely on God's word and to know that his word is said in the Bible that as the rain comes down from the heaven to the earth and does not return the same way, so also God's word that comes forth from him will not return to him empty. It will accomplish his purpose. You know, I just love it. If you know how many times it's written in the Bible that God accomplishes his purpose, he will work everything to accomplish his purpose. His word will accomplish his purpose. It will prosper in what God has sent it. So, I know the word of God tells me that God knows exactly what I need. And if he knows exactly what I need, I know he knows exactly what you need as well. Yes, that is in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8 tells us. Matthew 6, 8. It says, but when you pray. Oh no, 8, yeah. It says, let me actually start it from 7. Where you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating the words again and again. Don't be like them. For your father knows exactly what you need. Even before you ask. Whoa. Every time I read that. Ha. Ah, there is a rest that comes to my heart. God knows exactly what you and I need. Even before we ask. And so if he does know exactly what we need before I ask. Then it does not take him anything to do it. But he will do it in his own time. In his own way. 
And so we can rely on that promise that he knows what you need. He knows even before you do, he knows it. Better than you do, he knows it. I mean, because if he knows it before I ask, that means he knows what is essential, what is needful, that will accomplish his purpose. What I need that will, uh, is what will accomplish God's purpose. Because there is a need, a difference between what I want and what I need. And when God says he knows what I need, he knows what will accomplish his purpose. Because that is what he said. The Bible says in Proverbs that we just read that God works everything to accomplish his purpose. Philippians 4, 19 tells us, And my God will meet all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I know God. I have experienced this in my life. I know he meets and fully satisfies our needs. He knows it before we ask. And he said that according to his abundant riches in glory, he would do it. I mean, that in itself must put our heart at rest. It must douse our anxieties. It must doubt our worries, knowing that our needs will be met through Jesus Christ in accordance to his will. And the abundant riches of God's glory is infinite. It can never be exhausted. It is inexhaustible. And so that which I need is available in the abundance of the riches of God, of glory, in Christ Jesus. We can never lack what we need for as long as Jesus Christ is our provider. It's a matter of the timing. It's a matter of timing and we asking for the right motives. All right. Psalm 84, 11 tells us that the Bible tells us that no good thing will God withhold from us. God will not withhold what is good from you and I. And what is good, again, is what will accomplish his purpose. Psalm 84, verse 11 tells us, let's read that from the Bible. I don't want to paraphrase it. Hallelujah. Psalm 84, verse 11 says that for God, the Lord God, is our son and our shield. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will not withhold good thing. It says the Lord will withhold no good thing. From those who do right. He will never withhold something that is good. No good thing would he withhold. From them that walk uprightly. He will never withhold or hold back any blessing. From those who live innocently. Mm -hmm. God will never withhold good things from those who walk with integrity. Hmm. Our God, he doesn't hold back. He is generous in his gifts. He will never withhold any good thing from us. So when he doesn't fix it, we need to trust that he knows what is good for us because he will never hold anything that is good. He will never hold back anything that is good from us. In fact, the Bible went further to say in Matthew verse chapter 7, verse 11. So if you who are evil know how to give your children good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good things when you ask him? 
So when we ask God for things, when we ask God for what our heart desires, one thing we can be assured of is that he says that he knows how to give us good things. He is a generous giver. He will never withhold from us what is good for us. So if what we're asking for is not good for us in that time, he's not going to give it to us. I mean, if a, if a three-year-old child begins to cry and says that he wants to drive the father's car like my children did when they were young, I would be crazy to leave them in the car and leave the engine running. No, you wouldn't do that. Oh, if you, your, 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 my son, when he was young, kept asking, does the, does the, is the fire, is the flame in the candle, is it hot? He wanted to test it. And I'm not going to pour the wax into his hand for him to know that it is hot. No. Because what he is asking for was no good for him at that point in time. But when a 18-year-old or a 20-year-old begins to ask for a car, then you will first of all make sure that he has the license, the driving license. He has gone to learn how to drive. There is a process for it. A child who is still crawling we will not give something that he requires to run to play with. There is a timing for everything. And that's why I believe that Anything that we're asking for that is yet to come, in God, it, it is not yet the time for it. In God's timing, it will bring it to pass because God will not withhold from us any good thing. So I will keep asking and I will keep thanking and I will keep waiting in patience because I know sovereign, my God is sovereign. I can trust in his sovereignty. I will do what pleases him. And I can rely on his word because he says in Romans 8, 32, that since he did not even spare his own son, but he gave him up for you and I, won't he also give us everything else along with him, along with Jesus Christ? If God can give us his own son to die for us, what then can be so huge that we'll be asking for that he won't give to us if we to accomplish his purpose in our lives? Because ultimately, everything that God does is to accomplish his purpose. So we must rely on the power of God, our rely on the word of God, our real re reliance on the word of God is what will help to make us content to be at rest and to be at peace even when things don't go the way we desire. And believe me, this is not something that happens overnight. I mean, arriving at this place of confidence in God, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a daily work. It's a progressive work. It's something that we keep working at. That I, I'm not going to be anxious over this issue. I'm just going to trust that in God's time, in his way, he will bring it to pass. Because this is a righteous desire. I'm holding on his word. And I'm reliant and dependent on his word. And I would refuse to be agitated. I'm going to rest on his promises. I mean, I love this lyrics that says that it's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to know that he has said, thus says the Lord. And we can rest on it. You see, when life goes hard, we need to focus our mind. It is intentional. It is something that is active. It's not passive. We intentionally make our heart and our mind to focus on the word of God. To depend on the truth of God's word. To say, no matter what, no matter what may come my way, my life is in God's hands. I will trust in his promises. I will hold fast to his promises because I know that God is good and everything he does is good. And no good thing would he withhold from me. And all these pieces that I don't understand how they fit together, I trust that he who has the whole picture know how they all fit together. I don't have the full picture. He has the full picture. 
but it's a deliberate act. It's a deliberate action that we switch our mind to focus on the promises of God, to focus on the word of God, to focus on the character of God, and to trust that in his faithfulness, he will never deny us what is good for us. He will never deny us what will accomplish his purpose in our lives. It is the word of God that can stabilize our heart in those seasons of agitation. His word will stabilize our heart. It's like having a lifeline that you are holding on to in the midst of the storm and you are in the waters. And when you hold on to that lifeline, knowing that that lifeline leads right to the heart of God, it is tied to God. You know that you are not drowning. But we must hold and praise God. The word also assures us that God has a firm grip on you and I. No matter how fierce that storm may be, God has a firm grip on you and I. So we hold fast to the promises. We hold fast to the word. We rely on it. We anchor our faith on it. We don't let go while we are going through these challenges in our lives. You see, as we study the word of God and we meditate on it, it will give us the picture of the restoration that God is capable of doing in our situation. It will give us a picture of what God has the power to accomplish in you and I. What God's word can accomplish in you and I. And when we hold on to that picture, we fix it in our gaze. I mean, in those years when I was trusting God for my healing, I all I wanted to do, to make my heart to do, is to focus on that picture of restoration, of me being healed. In fact, I, one day I wrote, you know, in, my, in one of my blogs, that I had a vision of me at the airport with my, you know, my, my hand, holding my handbag and my carry-on and my ticket. I was ready to board a plane and there was no encumbrance, no thing whatsoever, no paraphernalia. You see, the reality of my life at that point in time was that if even to go to travel was impossible. At that time, I, was, I had already been told that I couldn't travel. And even when I was traveling, I had to carry oxygen with me. So that was the reality of my life. But the picture that I was focusing on is me traveling by myself without any encumbrances, without any paraphernalia. Because that is the picture of restoration that I got from the word of God. That God will restore me to fullness of life. He will restore me to the fullness of health. Yes, it did not happen in my own timing. Yes, it didn't happen as soon as I wanted it. But ultimately it happened. And today, I can travel without any encumbrances. Praise and glory be to God. Yes, the word of God will give us peace. It will bring calmness to our soul. And we must let the word of God dwell richly in us when life is challenging us, when life challenges, threatens to knock us over. But ultimately, the question is this. Even if I don't get what I want, Will God still be enough for me? Even if it doesn't play out the way I desire, will God still be, long, be enough for me? And that's the question that we must ask ourselves. When life challenges us and adversity comes away, things don't go the way we want, will God still be enough for you? If God doesn't fix that situation, would it still be enough? The truth of the matter is nothing in this earth is guaranteed. We can lose everything. Things, I mean, the only thing that is constant is change after God. Change is a constant in this world. And we must know what remains unchanging 
in all the changing seasons of our lives. If everything is taken away from us, will Jesus still be enough? I know there's a song that says, take everything but give me Jesus. Ah, we must all get to that place where we can say, take everything but give me Jesus. It will still be enough for me. When I'm knocked down and I can say, I will get back up again and find Jesus. When life becomes more than I can handle, I'm not going to quit because Jesus is enough for me. I not only believe that Jesus is enough for me, I confess that he has to be. I have to convince my heart, my desires and my dreams that Jesus is enough. Look at what Job said in Job 13. I mean, there's a lot to learn from the life of Job, especially when we're going through life's challenges. In Job 13, verse 15, Job chapter 13, verse 15, he said, God, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. <laughs> Though he slay me, even if he kill me, slay means to kill. Yet, I will trust in him. I have no other hope. I will maintain my ways before him. It says, even if he kills me, I will still trust in him. Hmm. I will hope in him. I will hope in him. I will trust in him. Hmm. Though he slay me, yet I will wait for and trust in him. Hmm. No matter what may come my way, my life is in God's hands. Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 3 hmm, says something familiar as well. Verse 17, it says... Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. Even though the fig tree have no blossom, and there are no grapes on the vine, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields, and the cattle's bands are empty, yet, yet, I will rejoice in God. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. He will make the for the sovereign God is my strength and he makes me as sure footed as the deer. Even if everything else fail, even if we lose everything. Hmm. The writer of Habakkuk is telling us that he will still rejoice in God. That is the extent of conviction of God's sovereignty and trust in God. It says, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. I will not lose my joy. I will not lose my joy even if everything does not go the way I want I will not lose my joy even if God doesn't fix the situation because he is the Lord of my salvation. He is my strength and he is sovereign. Hmm. I will, yet, I will be joyful. Yet, I will be joyful. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. Friends, will God be enough for you even if everything else does not work the way you desire? Would you still be able to rejoice in the God of your salvation? Would you still keep your joy even if God doesn't fix the situation? 
Hmm. Oh, for grace to trust in God this way. Oh, I pray for grace to trust in God this way that I can see with absolute certainty that I will rejoice in the Lord even if, no matter what may happen, I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. My friends, I want you to ponder on this tonight. That even if you don't get what you want, even if you don't get that breakthrough, will God still be enough for you? Will you trust in the sovereign God? Would you still rely on his word and stand on his promises? Would you retain your joy and rejoice in the Lord of your salvation? Ponder on this. I pray that the almighty God, who is sovereign, who is all-knowing, who is the supreme ruler, who does what pleases him and works everything to accomplish his purpose, who walk every single bit, every single detail of your circumstance to accomplish his purpose, that he will get the glory and the honor in your life. And I pray that that conviction of that truth, of God's infinite love for you, will anchor you and anchor your faith and trust in God, even when things don't go the way you want, even when you face challenges and life seems so difficult. Let's trust in Him. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. I don't have to worry. <laughs> yes, Lord, my life is in your hands now. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. Joy comes in the morning. Troubles will not always last. <laughs> mm. And there's a friend that's named in Jesus <laughs> who will wipe your tears away. Mm. And if your heart is broken, <laughs> just lift your hands and say, Oh, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in His hands. My life is in God's hands. Your heart, life is in God's hands. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid. Your life is in God's hands. Joy will come to you. Don't let the enemy steal your joy. No matter what you're going through. That trouble will not last. <laughs> that trouble will not last. <laughs> For we have a friend in Jesus. He will wipe your tears away. Hallelujah. And when your heart is broken, he will heal it and restore your heart. He will heal and restore your soul. That is his promise. Oh, that I can make it. God bless you real good. Thank you for this time together this evening. And I pray that the words that you have heard will be rooted in your heart and it will grow and nurture you and mature you in your faith. In Jesus' name, have a restful evening. Good night and God bless you.